Professor Oak, the fun-loving, easygoing man who always greets new trainers with a smile on his face. But was he always like this? How did he become a professor? And why does he know so much about Pokemon? All these questions and more will be answered today as we play through Pokemon The First Journey. Before jumping into this incredible fan game, let me know your favorite Professor Oak moment. Also, don't forget to subscribe and let's try to smash a whopping one like for The First Journey. With all that said, let's get into it. The game opens with a flashback to January 21st, 1936 in the Kanto region. We see a girl being scolded by her parents for choosing to marry a foreigner. After being disowned by her family, we fast forward to December 4th, 1953 in the Sevi Islands. We see a teacher telling her class about national college entry exams being held the following month. As a young Sam Oak exits his classroom, he's met by his three friends urging him to come to a party with them. We choose not to go as we're fixated on studying for our entrance exams to get into a good university. We then learn that the blonde girl is a young Agatha, but before learning the other's names, they head off for their party. Our legal guardian, Mr. Sanchao, tells us that Kurt is here from the Johto region and wants to speak with us before we settle into studying. We return a book we borrowed from the Jotonian boy and he tells us he'll be applying for a college in the West, to which we're ambivalent. Back at home, we take out our biology book and see Oak's inner thoughts, perhaps feeling a little bad about not seeing his friends, but he wants to get into Celadon University more than anything. One month after the exams, it's revealed that we got a perfect score, but we do start to observe the theme that Cantonians really have something against foreigners. We then peek into a discussion between the Dean and an admissions officer, learning that Professor Rowan wants us to work with him in the Unova region immediately. The conversation ends by stating that if we ever return to Kanto, it better be as a professor. We don't see any of Oak's time at Selyu, but instead jump ahead three years to March 14, 1957 at Vermilion Port. As we set foot back in our home region, we're met by our childhood friends, John, Athena, and Agatha. John then says he and Agatha have become tamers. Kurt invented his version of the Pokeball out of Apricorns while we were away, leading to what Cantonians are calling the Creature Craze. Interestingly, Sam seems to already know about this, as we see an aside where he mentions someone or something called Argonaut and claims that the mutation began too soon here. We learn that the mutation started about a year after we left and that people sell creatures in every major city. John has become fairly proficient in battling for money, and here, after a battle, the victor takes the loser's creatures. We say we'd like to battle, revealing that in the West, they've been capturing these creatures since the 19th century, starting in the Kalos region. Oak's Tauros then makes quick work of Athena's Flareon, Agatha's Jigglypuff, and John's Meowth. Our friend makes an interesting comment that physical strength no longer matters, and it's actually intelligence that equals power in this creature economy. Sam responds by stating that he's been sent here by the University of Unova in order to set up a social system where people can be employed as professional trainers. An international entity called the League is looking to set up an institution in this country to create occupations around Pokemon, the proper name for these creatures. We also reveal that we're now a professor and our goal is to find a suitable place to set up a lab and pick up our permit papers from the University in Celadon. This game taps into real socioeconomic and geopolitical themes, like John mentioning that the League outlawing taking other trainers' Pokémon will be an infringement on the political power of sovereign states. He also mentions that Agatha has been waiting for us, but we aren't interested in a relationship, only knowledge. John and Athena will be married soon, but before we can even congratulate our oldest friend, he runs off. At the Vermilion Inn, Athena tells us that Saffron is off-limits, so our trip to Celadon is gonna be a long one. We then get a flashback of John protecting us from some kids making fun of us for being foreign, which reveals that he's also a foreigner. Back to reality, I catch a Sandshrew on Route 11, but our Pokeball stock is very limited in this game, so I'll stick with two party members for now. On Route 12, Agatha tells us that John challenged a local gang leader, and now he and Athena are in trouble. She also mentions that she learned how to heal Pokemon, which we quickly dismiss by telling her she doesn't have the proper chemicals. We do, however, use her healing services since it'll otherwise cost $500 and money is very scarce in 1957. 
While making my way to the gang leader, Sandshrew evolves into Sandslash, which should help our team out a lot. Turns out the leader is a teenage, pimple-faced Koga who must have taken Athena as winnings off John. We step in to save her, challenging the wannabe ninja to a battle. Sandslash starts by tanking a Confusion and a Psybeam while landing two Magnitude 9s to take down his Venomoth. Next up is Victory Bell, so I swap Tauros into a Vine Whip that does about a quarter of his health. Our bull drops the Fly Trap with a pair of Horn Attacks, being hit by a Razor Leaf between the two. Last is an Ivasaur, which we also make quick work of with Horn Attacks after being hit by Takedown. After beating Koga, we tell him that we're a representative of the Pokemon League and that we'll need strong trainers like him. He's skeptical at first, but jumps at the chance of being paid $10,000 a month, even giving him his first payment in advance. Back in Lavender Town's Inn, the gang tells us that they want to travel with us. John found some cheap land on the western side of the region where we could set up our lab. Agatha also says it'll be like old times, hoping we won't be as distant as we were when we were younger. We agree to let them tag along and then show them the proper way to heal Pokemon. Athena suggests we open our own healing business, but unfortunately we respond by telling her that there are restrictions when it comes to proprietary knowledge. Couldn't agree more, Athena. We hate big corporations. Before heading off for the West, we reveal the bigger picture to Koga. The League has sent us here to set up a gym system. Koga will be a gym leader, having gym trainers underneath him and bestowing badges to trainers that beat him. Once a trainer proves their worth by obtaining a certain number of badges, they can challenge the League. But you all know how this works. Interestingly enough, we tell him that merchandise based on the champion is the real engine of the franchise, treating the Pokemon world as we know it today much more like a business than society. When asked how the government would allow a foreign organization free reign over their economy, we simply say that we're in the age of globalization and soon the whole world will experience change. Koga then has an odd request. He wants to customize his gym as he sees fit. This is actually where the idea of themed gyms came from, as we immediately see the genius of having different styles to add theatrics to the experience for trainers. After the poison user agrees to be a gym leader, Oak says to himself that he thinks he bought it. What's the real purpose of this gym system? For now, we move on through Rock Tunnel, where we battle each of our friends again, Athena adding an Arbok to her team, Agatha a Cubone, and John a Kangaskhan. When we tell Agatha that she needs to take battling more seriously, she comments on how all we ever do is work and study, never stopping to have fun or enjoy life. Before going to sleep for the night, we mention how it feels strange being back with the three. Agatha again says that she's happy we're traveling together, and then we go to bed. The next day, I decide to add a victory belt to my team, then also find a Charmander, and naturally the professor has to have his starters. We then see our group being attacked by an Arcanine that Athena pissed off, so after KOing it, she pretends to be sorry, but then curses the Fire Dog out for not being able to catch it. On Route 9, Charmander evolves, then we meet the leader of the Mountain Vulpix group, Aizo. He tells us they created their organization to protect Tamers from other predatory orgs. He also says that these malicious groups have been popping up all over the region like the Blazing Ponytas, Whispering Mankeys, Frosty Dugongs, and Shocking Buzzes. When asked to join the Volpixes, we tell Aizo that we actually need his group to disband and we'll be breaking up the remaining groups in the region. We explain that we can't have teams become more powerful than the government or use their influence to do evil. We then tell the boy that we'd like him to be a gym leader. We also finally start to mention things that the Cantonians are unaware of, like the physical special split and type advantages. When the sophomore university student asks why the creatures gain experience and get stronger, almost as if they were born to battle, our reply is simply that we want him to work for the League even more now. If we beat him in a battle, he'll accept our offer, so let's jump in. Aizo's Ninetales starts things off with a safeguard as Sandslash lands a magnitude 9 for big damage. After Flamethrower does half our health, a Magnitude 7 finishes the QB, bringing in a Mirror Match Sand Slash. I let ours go down to a few slashes and a Fury Swipes, doing around half to the opponent with two more Magnitudes. Two Horn Attacks from Tauros finish the Ground Type, who hits a Sand Tomb before going down. Then the AC King hits the field. After a Horn Attack does less than half, we take big damage from Waterfall. Fortunately, we crit our next attack to finish the battle before our bull can be brought down. 
With Idso's acceptance, we think that we can use the sentiment to our advantage that emotion drives battles, as opposed to thinking of them as chess moves. At Cerulean Cape, we walk into what is now Bill's house, mentioning that there are books here in Galarian. We seem nervous about something and mention we need to get going, presumably meaning we need to get to Celadon as soon as possible. We also have a flashback to simpler times with Agatha back in high school. Then after another battle, as she's trying to have a nice moment with us, we call her pathetic and dead weight, absolutely crushing her. Oak is really a jerk. After she runs off crying, all we think is that emotions hold humanity back from progress. We do see that Sam has some semblance of feelings, but he'll reject them all to achieve his goals. Let's go, Athena, really laying into Oak for what he said back at the Cape. Even talking to John can't get through to him. I hate this guy. Our best friend at least says he'll tell Agatha we didn't mean to hurt her and we just don't understand human interaction. Just after getting through the cave, a Charmeleon hits level 36, giving us Charizard. In Pewter Town, we run into the Whispering Mankeys, who say their leader uses a whole horde of Pokemon and just beat a group of Tamers, presumably John, Agatha, and Athena. It's now finally revealed that Oak and John are actually from a Sinonian tribe. After beating this gang member, we venture into Viridian Forest to take on the leader, catching an Ivasaur that evolves into Venusaur on the way. This fight against the leader is actually pretty tricky, facing off against 14 Pokemon in their mid-30s, but I was able to handle it on my first attempt. The important thing is that Oak mentions that League rules will dictate no trainer can use more than 6 Pokemon on a team. He also mentions that when technology allows for it, he'll physically limit a trainer's ability to carry more than 6 balls on their person, slipping briefly by saying it'll be easier to control people but catching himself to instead say prevent people from playing unfairly. After taking all the Pokemon away from the boy we let him go, then actually apologize to Agatha. She responds by saying we've lost so much of our humanity in just three years, clinging to a faint glimmer of hope that maybe this journey will change us for the better. After our friends leave to set up camp, I catch a Pikachu, then an event Execute drops in on me and after catching it we see a little dialogue line. Maybe I should have also caught that Arcanine. Now we finally make it to a spot known as the Hamlet which is probably familiar to you all. We comment that this feels like the perfect place for our lab, then head into the only house to talk to the owners, an older woman and her daughter. We offer to buy the land for the lab, but instead the woman says we can have everything if we marry the daughter. Of course, we don't factor emotion into any of our decisions, accepting the proposal in order to become a landowner. We do, however, postpone the marriage since we have a lot that still needs to be done across the region. We learn the girl's name is Sakura, and we're told our second child will need to be named Midori, or Green. Oak also comments about how Route 1 has weak Pokemon, Viridian would be great for the first gym, and the route to the west seems like a great place to end the journey. Now we finally learn the professor's true intentions. Distract the young and turn their lives into a show, stripping so many of them of an education and general life skills. He also mentions that we can do the same in the Johto region by placing the league directly between the two, on a plateau of Mount Silver. Since all the Cantonian towns are named after colors, this place will represent all colors, with Oak giving it the name Pallet Town. We tell our group that we found the spot for our lab and the land will soon be ours, conveniently leaving out the part about getting married. However, our objectives now are to find suitable locations for the gyms and deal with the tamer groups around the region. After telling John about type matchups, he makes the same comment as Idso about Pokemon seemingly being created to battle. When discussing evolution, our friend gives us the idea to create other evolution methods, to which we say it may keep more people entertained and it shouldn't be difficult to introduce. Essentially over time, Oak and the organization have manipulated certain Pokemon to evolve in certain ways, so you can thank them for stone, happiness, and trade evolutions. John challenges us to another battle, having a Persian, Nidoking, and Kangaskhan, starting to remind me of a certain someone's team. Anyway, back on Route 11, John tells us that someone who seemed dangerous was looking for us, also mentioning someone named Fuji was trying to find us. We say that if Fuji is here, that means he must have had a breakthrough in his research to cause multiple mutations or evolutions. We also tell our friend not to do so much thinking as it would be bad if he fell victim to what's coming. 
He's told to ignore it for now, and after taking a ferry to Route 13, our Pikachu evolves into Raichu. Now we run into the Fuchsia Tamer group, who, similarly to the Mountain Vulpixes, want to protect Tamers and ensure they all have equal resources. When we tell them about the League, they get angry and claim that they're stronger than the government, so it can't control them. After saying we're a representative of the League, and if they can't beat us, they have no chance against anyone else, the leader challenges us to a battle. This man leads in Articuno, as I send out Venusaur. It's an immediate swap to Charizard, who tanks Ice Shard, but after Flame Burst, an Ancient Power does huge damage. We're able to take the bird out on the next turn, then Rhydon comes in, so I go back to the grass starter to be. Venusaur survives Rock Blast and Chip Away in order to drop the Rock Ground type with a pair of Razor Leaves, but then another Articuno is sent out. This time I bring Raichu into Ice Shard, then trade Discharges with the move, coming out on top with 18 HP. Last is a Dragonair, which Tauros can Horn Attack twice for a knockout in order to defeat yet another Tamer group. We ask where the man got his Pokemon since they're too strong, but they run off, claiming they'll be back with their full power of over 100 members. The man that John was put off by then approaches us, seemingly another member of the League, who says he's going after that man. He also tells us the Cinnabar team is likely in the Seafoam Islands, and there's a Saffron Guild that's very tough. They even know about abilities, natures, and EVs. Apparently type matchups are a complete lie, and the man says Fuji is having second thoughts about the weapon. Two places called Avropia and Atlantica will soon be engulfed by war, and then the eastern nations will follow. He also mentions that regardless of which side this country takes, it won't end well for them. He leaves with a warning not to let my hatred for this country consume me, but also not to let my childhood memories get in the way of what needs to be done. Flashback to a year ago in the Atlantican state of Unova, Elm says we did it and Rowan states he knew picking me was the right decision. We appear to be in a room of Cell U students and what seems to be a confined Mew, but after being congratulated by an army general, we're back to the present day. In Fuchsia, John tells us that a strong Pokemon has been attacking Ferrymen and has the idea of riding Pokemon on the water, which we believe can be done with the move Surf. The Pokemon ends up being a Lapras, which we catch, and then comment that this nation was supposed to be granted far weaker Pokemon. Is everything about the creatures completely engineered? We send the Ferrymen back and evoke something called Gen Memcode 03 to forcibly teach Lapras Surf, and wow, I love this overworld sprite. As we go to sleep for the night, we have a dream about Rowan praising us about our studies on genetics. He says that we can proceed to the final step, and we should be the one to carry it out, but then John wakes us up as we were screaming in our sleep. Outside, we find a magic carp at level 1, and after catching it, Oak gets the idea for the EXP share. Now in the Seafoam Islands, we run into Blaine, but before his group can gang up on us, our friends come in to even things out a bit. The Afroad Man leads a Moltres as I send out Lapras. Two Flamethrowers leave us with 46 HP as a pair of Surfs drop the Fiery Bird, bringing out another Fire Flying type, Charizard. We're outsped and KO'd by Flame Burst, and next turn Raichu just can't get the one shot with Thunderbolt, so he's forced to eat a Dragon Rage before taking the Lizard down. We're faster than Flareon and can nuzzle the Evolution, getting two full Paras and landing a Thunderbolt before swapping Sand Slash into Paralysis number 3. A dig finishes the cat off, but now Arcanine comes in and intimidates our hedgehog. I bring Charizard in, who trades wing attacks with the dog's takedowns and retaliates, but we're eked out and KO'd before we could finish it off. Now it's back to Sandslash, who magnitudes for the knockout as Arcanine agilities, leaving Blaine with only a Rapidash. Unfortunately, the horse lands Inferno, so we're auto-burned and our dig does under half its health. I also land a Magnitude 7 before going down to Fire Spin, but with so little health remaining, Tauros can come in, dodge an Inferno, and win the battle with Horn Attack. Blaine then reveals that he got into Cell U at the same time as us, but dropped out since the creature craze was so profitable. Outraged that anyone would stop their pursuit of education, we let Athena take his Mons until he agrees to go back and graduate. We then show some humanity, saying we should take a break to relax on Cinnabar before continuing on to Celadon. We also tell Agatha that we've been having dreams about the people we used to know back home, telling us not to go through with whatever it is we're doing here. We finally disclose that in the States, we partook in a research project that totally changed us. 
Later, on the volcanic island, we finally give Agatha a true apology, stating that we truly are a miserable person. Some days later at Celadon University, we rush into Dean Jen's office who tells us that we've run into some issues with the government giving a permit to a foreigner. But once we tell him that our bride-to-be is a native, he says we shouldn't have any problems. With our lab permit and the ability to pass freely through the Saffron checkpoints, we're ambushed by a new tamer group, the Snarky Tangrowths. They're made up of Cell U students turned tamers and we meet their leader, Kikuno, on Route 16 to the west. The game now explores gender norms, with the girl stating she wants to be a doctor, but people always tell her she can only be a nurse. Oak also remarks that he was surprised that females are allowed to be tamers in this region. We come to the realization that we need to loosen societal norms in order to drive spending and increase the league's money-making capabilities in the new economy. Then to test if we're crazy or not, Kikuno challenges us to a battle. She leads a Steelix as I switch Tauros out into Sand Slash to tank Rock Tomb. After setting up Stealth Rocks, we crit a Magnitude. Next, we go underground and avoid Rock Tomb, giving Kikuno the opportunity to Autotomize as our dig also crits for solid damage. Two Autotomizes later and we've dropped the Steel Snake, bringing in Needle Queen. A Poison Sting ends up poisoning us and then we avoid Body Slam to dig for half its health. Sadly, Earth Power brings us low enough to drop to Poison, so I guess I should've used Magnitude instead of digging there. I bring Lapras out next, who takes about a third of her health from Stealth Rocks, then a Body Slam paralyzes her, but we tough it out for an Ice Beam kill. Dodrio's E-Speed leaves us at 6 HP as our next Frozen Blast brings the birds to about the same. After dropping to Uproar, Raichu takes one himself before finishing the Roadrunner with Thunderbolt. As Blossom comes in, I decide to test Slam Damage, immediately regretting my decision as a crit does around a fourth and the Grass-type Quiver dances. I'm now forced to swap Charizard into Rocks, which bring him low, but even with the special attack boost, Mega Drain doesn't do much. It still takes two Flame Bursts to get the knockout, being paralyzed by Stun Spore in the process, but the Hula Dancer did also set up Sun for us. Last is Leafeon, who nasty plots as it only takes a single Flame Burst to fry the evolution, giving us yet another win over a Tamer group. After giving Kikuno the whole spiel about the new society, she accepts the position of Gym Leader and we move on to Saffron. Turns out the last Tamer group, the Shocking Buzzes, are holding the Governor hostage, so we need to take them out in order to speak with the man. In Sylph Groceries, we see more members of the group threatening Sylph Jr. Just as they leave, the army's Colonel Hayao barges in and demands that Mr. Sylph gives up control of his land. We seem to know this man, and as John comes in to see what's going on, we allude to him being a part of a manhunting operation 20 years ago in the Sevi Islands. We quickly discover this man killed our father, and John starts rampaging, taking down the soldiers and vowing to kill the colonel. Just then, the man sends out a Palkia, blasting our friend against the back wall. As Sam thinks to himself that the League may have been a bit too generous with their donations to the government, he shouts some code, releasing the Pokemon back to a set of given coordinates. The army flees and John comes to his senses. We tell him that we have a plan that'll make sure our revenge is absolute. We explain to the Sylphs that the League is supplying the Kanto government, and if they choose to do so, they can impose a food shortage on the entire nation, forcing them to enter negotiations with the outside world. We propose that the Sylphs turn their grocery store into a corporation that'll sell merchandise, healing items, capture devices, and other essentials for the Pokemon economy. Sam also promises that the family will be financially taken care of for generations, and thus Sylph Co. as we know it is born. We also cue John in that we've been planning on himself, Agatha, and Athena becoming gym leaders this whole time, and assuming the Shocking Buzz's leader cooperates, we'll have eight people lined up. The leader says we'll have to battle his whole group back to back, ending with him. Once the townsfolk and the mysterious man in black are all present, we announce our acceptance of the challenge with the goal of getting the group to disband. We fight through a gauntlet of seven trainers with very solid Pokemon, and then learn that the leader knows about IVs, EVs, and the physical special split. As we ask who told them about these things, the man in black heads off. I wonder if we'll ever uncover who he is. Anyway, the leader introduces himself as Suyo, and it's time for a boss battle. Of course his lead is a Zapdos, but I have Sand Slash out, so at least I know I won't be hit by any big electric attacks. 
I Swords Dance twice as the Thunderbird charges, then hits a not very effective Ancient Power. At plus two, we two-shot with Crush Claw and get good RNG as the bird agilities twice instead of doing more damage. Next up is a far-fetched as I opt to sack my Charizard at low health to get Raichu in for free. We cook this bird with a crit Thunderbolt, and as Suyo's own electric rat comes in, I swap Venusaur into Nuzzle. Our grassy toad takes more abuse while setting up a pair of growths, one-shotting Raichu with Petal Dance when he's down to 40 HP. The next Mon out is Jolteon, but we managed to survive a Discharge, and since we're locked into the powerful Grass-type move, we get yet another knockout. Last up is Electivire, who finally takes Venusaur down, but it seems the Sinonian Mon doesn't have anything to damage Sandslash, so two digs later and we've beaten the shocking buzzes. The public display was orchestrated by us to gain Citizen's approval of a regulated body taking control of the creature craze, but Suyo runs off, claiming he'll never bend the knee to any organization. We then recall a nice memory with John as kids where he swears to always have our backs. Now that we can finally speak with the governor, it's actually an interesting conversation. He claims we're underestimating the intelligence of the Kanto citizens, but we concede that we're actually now aware of their true potential. We even tell the governor that with his support of the Sylph's new business, he'll become much more popular with his citizens. Now we finally get our first look at the Unova region, where an operative tells an army general that Fuji is a traitor and he's the one who told Suyo about Pokemon attributes. The solution is to trigger sleeper agents in the country that will instill belief in a bottom-up domestic grassroots movement, making the citizens believe they're controlling things themselves. We also learn about someone called Pioneer who's been spreading lies about Pokemon that will shape the regulations for how people do battle going forward. Once alone, the general turns out to be a completely different person, stating that the Age of Reason will soon become the Age of Subjectivity. In order to forever control the masses, the leaders of the world will seemingly save them from self-induced turmoil. Just then, someone named George appears out of nowhere and claims that the president has been informed that this man has been impersonating the general of the Unova army. George sends out a Delabird as the man reveals a Hydreigon to face it. GA says the man is from Artemisia and swears he'll destroy the entire nation if he needs to. Turns out GA stands for Getsis Age. Is this man actually Getsis lurking in the shadows ever since the late 50s? He then, similarly to Sam, shouts some code that devolves Delibird into an adorable yet presumably weak Pokemon. After killing the man, a week goes by. We now see a messenger in the city of Artemisia speaking with somebody who asks if he's found the woman. That's all we get to see of the outside world as we cut back to the finished Sylphco and Kanto. After speaking to each of our friends, we reflect more and more on what we're doing for the League and if it's really the right thing to do. When speaking to Agatha, we even catch ourselves getting teary-eyed at the thought of people from our childhood disapproving of our actions in our nightmares. We then tell the girls that they'll be gym leaders, yet again vaguely stating, we have our reasons. In our temporary lab within the building, we receive some missions to complete from the League. Even learning within one of these mission logs that Oak is actually the aforementioned pioneer, so I guess everything we're teaching our friends about Pokemon is actually just a fabrication. We talk to one of our aides about creating TMs and HMs, mentioning they shouldn't be reusable so we can profit more off of them. It's even revealed that we're responsible for creating all the Rock Smash cut and strength puzzles throughout the region. Next, we orchestrate the construction of the first Pokemon Center in Viridian, scatter some items around the region, and then have rematches with each prospective gym leader to test their strength, but I won't be showing all of these since I'm sure this video will be plenty long without them. We even turn the population of what will be known as the Legendary Birds impotent so they won't be accessible to many trainers. That one seemed to take a toll on Oak. After the rematches, John mentions that they found a suitable last candidate, a man named Watson who's here from Hoenn overseeing the reconstruction of the power plant. We pay the man a visit, assuring him he can keep his other position, as well as being a gym leader, then start a battle as a formality to test his strength. The Hoenn resident leads a Kabutops as I send in Venusaur. He screeches and I growth, then next turn Ancient Power does half our health, but a Petal Blizzard one-shots his fossil. Stunfisk is up next and actually survives one of the same, then takes us out with a not very effective Thunderbolt. Sandslash comes out to Swords Dance twice, eating two revenges and finishing the backwards fish with Earthquake. 
at plus four, we also destroy Watson's Raikou, Luxray, Manectric, and Electivire, winning the battle with relative ease. With that, we give Watson first choice a gym location, and thus the Saffron Gym is built. He also asks if we'll ever introduce Pokemon that mimic human movements, creating a fighting type, but we say to stick with Electric for now. We cut to each gym location, with Koga heading up Fuchsia, Kikuno becoming the Celadon leader, Aizo settling in Cerulean, Blaine in Cinnabar, and Athena, Agatha, and John heading to Vermilion, Pewter, and Viridian, respectively. Plagued by another flashback, we decide to head back home to Two Island to maybe settle our mind. The Sylp Assistant tells us our lab has been built, and we almost slip that we haven't even been married yet, but perhaps for Agatha's sake, we instead say we haven't obtained the necessary permits yet. We also have some new missions from the League, so before going home, we create the Fairy, Dark, and Fighting types, with the Taxonomy Machine stating it'll take one year for genetic mutation to occur. We then remove abilities, natures, and EVs, giving us good old Gen 1 mechanics, but the changes won't take place for four years. A barn in Pewter is converted to a museum where we tell the curator to fabricate history to make it seem as though Pokemon have always been around and have had a hand in shaping the region's culture. He tells us that Kurt and Cynthia are also League operatives who have already rewrote history as it pertains to Johto and Sinnoh. Back home, we pay respects to what I'm assuming is our father's grave, having a flashback of ourselves and a young John playing around with him. Then an old man shows up telling us he comes here every day to pay his respects. When asked if we'll ever forgive them, we simply say no and that he should pray that his offspring never go through the same as he and his father did. On top of the rematches we had with our prospective gym leaders, it's time for our final showdowns with our friends to make sure they deserve the positions we gave them. First up is Agatha, leading a Skarmory against my Raichu. Our first Thunderbolt gets a full para, so next turn the Steel Bird goes down, bringing in Marowak. I swap Venusaur into a big Earthquake, and as Petal Dance isn't enough to KO the ground type, we drop next turn to another. Lapras comes in to surf the club wielder after being screeched, and with a Scizor next, the obvious play is to go to Charizard. Despite a Swords Dance from Agatha's side, her bug is slower than our Lizard as a single flamethrower melts the Ironclad Scyther. Her Wigglytuff fails a Mimic as I bring Sand Slash in, then after Swords Dancing to plus 4, we drop her starter with Earthquake. I decide to play things safe against Glaceon, going back to Charizard who lives through Blizzard and Ice Shard to get the kill with two flamethrowers. Last is a Blissey who actually takes Zard down with Seismic Toss, but Tauros easily finishes the normal type with Horn Attacks for the win. Agatha then tries telling us about human conscience and how logic and emotion need to exist together in a balance. We suddenly feel the warmth of our father hugging us, claiming everything we do is not for us, but Agatha says we're acting out of self-righteousness and it's egotistical to think that we're the ones who can bring justice onto others. We reject her ideas, and as we turn to leave, her final words to us are that she hopes the old Sam will return one day. John even says that this whole time we've just been shaping Kanto the way we want it, but he seems to be focused on this last fight between us. He leads Persian as I send in Sand Slash. After we both Swords Dance, we're able to tank two play roughs, but Persian can't stand up to our Earthquakes. Nidoking is next, who outspeeds us for a Surf KO, so I go to Lapras. Surf is strong enough for a two-shot on the Poison Ground type, who for some reason Ice Beams us turn one before at least using the neutral Fire Blast. I swap Tauros in against Kangaskhan, who fails Sucker Punch. Then we lock ourselves into Thrash, eating one priority Dark type move and dodging Hammer Arm to get the kill. In order to snap out of confusion, I bring Venusaur in against Dugtrio, who actually opts for Final Gambit, knocking itself out and leaving our Grass type with 20 HP. Before going down, we do over 50% to Steelix with Petal Blizzard, then finish it off with Charizard's Flamethrower. Last is Rhyperior, who actually goes down to Flamethrower spam as it only uses the not very effective Hammer Arm against us before falling. We then see that John designed the Feather Badge himself, claiming that he made a promise and if he manages to fulfill it, he'll ditch ground types for flying. Now we head to Vermilion to take on Athena and her fire types. Her Flareon actually takes Charizard down with a combination of Extreme Speed and V-Create, only losing half its health to Air Slashes. Lapras is able to outspeed the Evolution for a Surf Knockout, but as Moltres comes in, I decide to sack Venusaur to Flare Blitz, sadly letting the bird set up Swords Dance first. 
Raichu outspeeds for a Thunderbolt, but the recoil it took wasn't enough for us to knock it out as Outrage destroys our rodent. I go to my fastest Montoros to Horn Attack for the KO, then Thrash Rapidash twice for another as we take half from Mega Horn. I get one more hit in on Kingdra before being taken out by Scald, but Lapras's Ice Beams are able to drop the dragon without taking too much damage. Next is Vileplume who Giga Drains us down to the red, but instead of taking the Water Dino out turn 2 with Toxic, so some Ice Beams lead to a double knockout. Last is Arbok, whose Intimidate is bad for Sand Slash, but we still don't have much trouble taking the snake down with some Earthquakes for the win. With all the gyms set, we place a Flag of Conquest down at the Indigo Plateau so that the League can begin construction on their Kanto HQ. We then receive an ominous email telling us to meet an old friend in Viridian. We also have a few more missions to take care of, but these aren't all from the League. First, we stop back home and have Sakura record her voice saying, Grant Hatch Access. We then tell her that if the Earth starts shaking or she hears a monstrous roar, she should run to the lab, say those words, and stay in the bunker with her mother until we come to get them. Speaking of her mother, Sakura tells us that she went to Route 23 to see her tribe, but it's dangerous there as soldiers have been surveying the area for months. We then give John some kind of override code and tell him to spread it to all the gym leaders. When the time comes, he'll need to defend himself and his family. As we bolt out, our next task is to set up the Pokemon Encyclopedia Project, also known as the Pokedex. Oak makes a great point here that nobody ever thinks about. The entries are preloaded into the deck, so why would a professor ever need a trainer to log them? It's simply to exploit the trainer's feelings of mystery and wonder. We also pitched the introduction of a Pokemonology major at Cell U, and now it's time to address that email. This sends us on a hunt that eventually leads to a lighthouse in Northern Kanto where we catch a Pikachu. Presumably this becomes Red Starter as Sam says he should save it for someone special. The man who is looking for us is revealed to be Fuji, asking us one last time if we've reconsidered what we're doing here. Of course we say no and the man invokes some code to lock all of our Pokeballs. He says that he's been trying to undo everything we've done, following us every step of the way, and that the irony of John supporting us is that he doesn't even realize we're going to cause similar suffering to what his tribe went through. We think of Agatha one last time, but our lust for vengeance is just too strong. Fuji throws us into the ocean and says he only needs about an hour to destroy the equipment at the Indigo Plateau. We learn the man in black is named Argonaut, and after saving us from the ocean, he chases Fuji down and breaks his jammer, but unfortunately couldn't best him in battle. Before giving chase ourselves, we call our presumed superior, Aristia, to give us the unlock code for Pokeballs. At the Cinnabar Volcano, it's time for our final face-off with our old friend. He claims he'll never rest until he rewrites the genetic code of Pokemon. We tell him that not only will we make Kanto pay, but the West will too in due time. And with that, we jump into battle. He leads a level 77 Smeargle that sets up spikes before going down to some thrashes from Tauros. Next up is a Snorlax who goes for submission as I bring in Venusaur. After missing Sleep Powder, the big guy explodes, so that's a double knockout. I then bring in Charizard as Fuji goes to Dragonite, barely doing any damage through multi-scale with Dragon Claw. As we dodge Draco Meteor, we're hit next turn by E-Speed and get two more D-Claws off before going down to Hurricane. Lapras takes big damage from the flying type move, but can finish the pseudo off with Ice Beam, leading to a Jolteon coming out. Sand Slash is unaffected by Thunderbolt, and even with Baby Doll Eyes lowering our attack, we're still able to get the KO with two EQs. I let my Hedgehog drop to Dugong's Blizzard so I can get Raichu in without needing to take any damage. We manage to land back-to-back -back Thunders and dodge Sheer Cold, leaving Fuji with just a second stronger Dragonite. Thankfully, Raichu survives Ice Punch in the red to nuzzle the Ace, so we also get a Thunder off before going down. Thanks to the speed drop, Lapras is able to move first, Ice Beaming the level 80 Mon back into its Pokeball, claiming us victory over the traitor. Fuji wishes us a long life so we have time to repent, but his inner monologue reveals that he stole the Pokeball Overwrite code, which may give younger generations a chance for true freedom. As we enter the endgame, a government employee tells us that they've been having issues with a native tribe around Route 23 who can actually control Pokemon without catching them. Could it be the same tribe Sakura's mother comes from? We seem to have a genuine hope that she's okay. 
On our way to the tribe's village, we find the woman, and although we've resolved ourselves to aid the government, we tell her everything is going to be okay. At the village, we take on the natives who say they'll offer me up to their monsters. After taking down the chief's team of three Charizards, a Rhyperior, Venusaur, and Blastoise, Sam thinks about saving the tribe's people, but comes to the conclusion that it won't matter anyway. John comes running in asking what's going on here. We try to tell him to play along, but our friend goes and speaks with the chief, provoking the soldiers. Since these natives don't fit into our fabricated history, the government plans to assimilate them into modern society, leaving their culture to be nothing more than a memory. John tries to plead with us that we're responsible for making sure these people don't befall the same fate we once did, but his pleas fall on deaf ears. Just then, we get some kind of call telling us this tribe is in possession of a certain ore. Suddenly, Sam's demeanor becomes tense as he tells the soldiers they need to get on with their task immediately and that he'll help. John then forces us into a battle of ideals, flipping the protagonist's view from Sam to his childhood friend. Unfortunately, Oak invokes a code to neutralize all our attacks, ending in total defeat. As John finally understands that everything his friend has been doing is a sham, Oak simply says that he and his organization are the emancipators of this world. He does at least allow John to take the Akka tribe with him to Viridian, as the Sinonian says he'll pay to keep them sheltered and fed. It's then revealed that not only did the government hunt down our father for being a foreigner, but also our mother just for marrying one. At mention of this, Sam says that these people won't be re-educated, but John needs to allow their descendants to be assimilated into society. He decides to house the Akka family in Pallet Town so that Oak never forgets his heinous actions or his own misery. One week later, the League HQ is constructed and a siren goes off around the region telling all males to report to their nearest authoritative branch. It seems that the Kanto region has decided to enter an ongoing war on the Eastern Front. Argonaut confirms that we truly are the operative name Pioneer, who spread lies about Pokemon battling across the region so that when they entered the war, they'd be sure to lose. Our efforts to shape society and create a dependency on Pokemon molded the population to a new generation, Generation Zero. Argonaut then urges us to push a button to activate a weapon that'll usher in the era of enlightenment. Just then, we have another flashback to our father and John. He endearingly calls our friend Giovanni, symbolizing the big bad he finds so cool. Colonel Hayao barges in and captures our father, but we manage to escape with John. Finally, here, we see the onset of the rage that has been burning in Oak since this moment, as he screams that he hates the Cantonians with all his being. Back to the present day, Oak is ready to take everything away from the people who've wronged him all those years ago. Transmitting a message across the entire region for Pokemon to enter a state called Ragnarok. Surging with power, the beasts run wild, destroying everything in their path as Oak looks on in total satisfaction. This occurrence has left the government no choice but to surrender, but it's noted that the gym leaders were still able to control their Pokemon, thus preventing any citizens from being harmed. In true irony, the government cements our place as the savior of the people. In a press conference, Oak then proposes the plan we learned about in the Unova region, seemingly taking the League under domestic control to give the citizens the feeling that they're in charge. As the conference ends, things cut away to John, stating that the code we gave him allowed him to override Ragnarok, and he knows that a part of us deep down never wanted to harm innocent people. We finally marry Sakura, with Agatha looking on at the ceremony in tears. Jumping 22 years into the future, we see Athena and John incepting what'll later become Team Rocket, an organization that's true purpose is to combat the League and one day free the world from their control. The two now go by the names Ariana and Giovanni, claiming that while Sam may know what they're plotting, there's another group not yet active in this region that he might not know of. Another two years pass as Sam and his superior Aristia discuss planting a spy into Team Rocket, the Admin Petrol. They then plot to associate the group with crime in an effort to thwart their plans. Interestingly, Aristia mentions some lab rats, which I can only imagine are the trainers that'll set out on their journeys from Kanto. In 1996, we see the fruition of that statement, with Elm talking to Sam about using his own grandchild and the grandson of the Akkas, Red, for some kind of experiment. 
Little do they know that back in 1986, Giovanni found something that allowed himself, Ariana, Blaine, and Fuji to completely disable Ragnarok, with the seed generating four years later. As the title screen flashes, this time with only a young Oak present, the credits roll, concluding the first journey. Wow, that was not how I expected a game about Oak's backstory to go. I was fully immersed in this world of shadow organizations, geopolitical manipulation, and moral dilemmas from beginning to end. Who would have thought Team Rocket would actually turn out to be the good guys? This game is actually packaged with a direct sequel called Red's Journey West, so if you want to see what happens next, be sure to subscribe. Also, if you made it this far, consider leaving a like. It really helps out. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.